hope you get your McDonald's You Deserve a Break Today passport in winning order. Already is, Sonny. Did you know that you can win a $100,000 trip or $100,000 in cash? I take the cash. Over a quarter of a million dollars or the vacation of your dreams? I take the cash. Uh, Hawaii? Cash. You like Rio? I like cash. So play McDonald's You Deserve a Break Today game today. I'm a winner. Oh, so you're going to take, take the, the cash. cash. This is the toughest world there is for a washer. It's a world where wash day never ends. That's why in this world you see so many speed queens. Because everything that goes into this washer has to be built to last. And what makes this speed queen tough enough for this world makes this speed queen tough enough for yours. Speed queen, built tough. See the complete line of speed queen washers at one of Woodville Appliance's three convenient locations. College football's top 10 on 24 News tonight. climb a 60-foot pole, and then make their death-defying descents. I'm Fran Tarkin. Arthur Luke was a 63-year-old school bus driver, but a lottery ticket gave him a wonderful retirement, two million dollars in cash. I'm Kathy Lee Crosby. The St. Lawrence River is almost a mile wide. Tonight you see a man attempt to jump it. In of all things, a Lincoln Continental. And that's not all you'll see. Tonight on... That's incredible. Scientific wonder. From Silkian. Hair so clean it floats. So clean it floats. Silkian's, the full strength cleaning shampoo that changes with the condition of your hair. Full strength cleaning here, gentle where you need it. So clean it floats. So clean. Silkian's self adjusting shampoo. Tonight's first story is about a young boy with a health problem, one that prevented him from leading a normal life. That's Incredible had a small hand in trying to aid this boy through the use of space-age technology. We helped bring him and his family together with a team of scientists. For most kids, playing outside on a warm summer's day is something that's taken for granted. Two-year-old John K. Edwards has never known that pleasure. John K., as he's called, suffers from a rare and limiting hereditary disorder. I don't think that John K. realizes the problem he really has until there are other children outside playing. When he can see those children out there playing, he wants to go out. And then he feels like he's being shorted or cheated out of something. John K.'s condition is anhydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. 
One of the biggest problems with John Kay and his disorder is the fact that he doesn't have sweat glands. Sweat glands serves as an air conditioning system for your body. When you get overheated, you sweat, and the sweat cools the body down. When John Kay gets hot, his body temperature starts to rise and will continue to rise if you don't cool him down. Because of that, John Kay is confined to the house where the temperature can be controlled. We have tried cooling him down with air conditioning. We keep our air conditioner at about 68 degrees. And cool water, putting in a cool bath, cold drinks, things of this nature. If you don't do this, then it could cause him to pass out. It could cause a heat stroke. It could take his life. It could cause brain damage. He does a lot of playing at night when there's nobody else outside. There's not much life for a child at night. Their time is during the day. Doctors have told us there's no cure for John Kay. Uh, the first doctor that we talked to told us not to go from doctor to doctor trying to find a cure because we would be wasting our money. But we did it anyway. We just hoped that maybe in the 1980s there was something out there that these doctors didn't know about. There was something out there that had not occurred to medical doctors. It involved the space-age technology that had been developed to insulate astronauts from an otherwise forbidding environment. Almost by accident, the Edwards learned of a man who might be able to help John Kay. We saw Larry Kuznets on TV showing his space equipment and the garments which he uses. And we knew this was for John Kay. Early in my career at NASA, we discovered that uh, there are severe cooling problems with astronauts in space. These problems are generated from the fact that an astronaut in a spacesuit is like uh, a person sealed in a closed closet or in a thermos bottle. Uh, there's not enough air that can be circulated through the garments to cool the individual. Consequently, we discovered a device that uh, looked like it might have potential to help us, and that was a liquid-cooled garment. Now, the liquid-cooled garment acts by substituting a cooling substance against the body for the normal means of evaporation. The sweating is reduced by about 80 percent. A person can work for harder periods of time in a stressful environment. When I initially was contacted by uh, John Kay's uh, parents, my response was this, this would be just a wonderful opportunity to try to help uh, uh, a child with a malady that seemed was helpable using a technology that we had learned. This is Flexotherm, a material we've developed for advanced liquid-cooled garments for future spacesuits. We've developed a miniature version of this for John Kay and for his cooling system. Uh, Mr. Recently, the Edwards family traveled from their home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Bill Elkin's Life Sciences Laboratory in Mountain View, California. It was time now to test the specially designed clothing, which offered the hope of helping John Kay to live a more normal life. We've assembled a team of scientists here, both from within and with outside, outside the space program, that are all working in a voluntary program to try to help John Kay's situation. And the culmination of all their efforts has been these garments here in front of you, which are really only prototypes. What we're going to be doing is taking baseline measurements and evaluating certain temperatures to see whether or not these garments might help John Kay. All right, John Kay, we've got some new clothes for you. We've got some brand new clothes. Oh, okay. And Ruthie, yeah. before we get the clothes on, the first thing we want to do is figure out uh, the calibration temperature for you right up here. Yeah, look up here. And Norm, you tell me when you got it. Norm Eisenberg, a skilled thermographic technician, will use a heat-sensitive camera to monitor and measure John Kay's changing body temperature. Okay, you got it? Look this way. Yeah, look at this. Dr. Kuznets uses a special thermometer called a temperature probe to get exact pinpoint readings. 94 and a half. Uh, right back of leg, 93 and a half degrees. Uh, left front of chest, 94 degrees. Now what we're going to do is try on your new clothes.
clothes again. Remember these clothes? They're a lot colder now. Come on, we have another lollipop for mm. you. Do it. All right. Here you go. Here. Ooh. <laughs> now, okay, with a new cooling down. shirt on, John Kay's body temperature will be checked again. Let's keep me truck. Here, wait a second. I'm getting all hot, and you're cold. What am I going to do? He won't do that. All right, first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a baseline on him, Norm, okay? Just take a reading with nothing on his head. Sure. You got a good you got a good temperature at about 96 on his forehead. Okay, now I'm going to put this hat on him, and we're going to hold it just for a few seconds, and I want you to scan the surface. You can see, Larry, as the cap goes on, you can see that the colors change, therefore the temperatures are lowering. And as he turns his head around and takes the cap off there, you can see that the light blue is about 14 degrees difference between the yellow that was before the cap went on and now. Both shirt and hat seem to be quite effective in lowering and stabilizing John Kay's temperature. Linda, what we have developed at Life Support Systems for John Kay is a liquid-cooled vest and headliner that's based on our commercial units, but it's scaled down just for John K. Now the liquid flows from the control display unit through this line, up to the headliner, through the headliner, back down again into the vest, and returns to the unit. And that's a very effective way of conductive cooling. All right, we're going to put the vest on now, Jan. Here, let me wrap this around. Yeah. Raise your arm up. Raise your arm. You've got to have your driving arm free, don't you? Let me just this. Get it nice and snug, and then we have a shoulder strap. Wait a minute, you got to put your headliner on first. Let's put this on first, and then we'll and put then, your And then, feel how cool that is. Let's see, look at mama. And now we can put this on. There, now you really look like a race car driver. I'd like to see John K. be able to go outside and play with other children when he wants to. And not have to stand at that door, knocking on that door to go out and play when it's too hot. I think he needs room to grow, he needs space. He's a little boy. Locking him inside of the house for the rest of his life is sure to bring more problems than he can, he can bear. Thanks to the work of a dedicated group of scientists, John Kay can now safely leave his house and begin to experience life as other children do. just the beginning. The suit works, but it doesn't work perfectly. It is, after all, a prototype in a new field of technology. John Kay's problem is still being worked upon. We'll keep you posted on any and all developments. This is Lori John Oganowski. She's 15 years old, and she's here to give us an example of her specialty. astounding prowess in a moment, along with these stories. A daring stunt driver will attempt to leap a mile across a river in a slightly used Lincoln Continental. New improved general purpose battery from Ever Ready is improved to run longer than ever. But the cat's low price like it was before. Same low prices. This economy four pack still costs less than two alkaline batteries. A longer running cat, and it still saves you money. Save with the longer running cat. Joyce, I'll never sleep with this stuffed up nose. Got some capsules, tablets, liquid. They can't do what this can do. New Dristan Long Lasting Nasal Mist. Relieves congestion fast. Lasts up to 12 hours. That was fast. 
I'm clear. Get some sleep. In actual tests with Dristan's medicine, many patients particularly noted an improved ability to sleep. Dristan mist got me through the night. I'm still clear. New Dristan long-lasting nasal mist with the longest-lasting decongestant you can buy. Gramp, I'm here to help you install your garage door opener. I did it myself, son. It's a Stanley. Hey, Dad. Thanks for the garage door opener. I'll show you how to put it up. Oh, we, we did it this morning. The Stanley. Yeah. Oh. Harry. Oh, happy birthday, dear. You did it yourself. Uh -huh. It's, it's a, a Stanley. Stanley. Buy a Stanley U install opener and get an extra transmitter for only $10.99. You can save up to $27.50 through October 31st. Tuesday. Will Fonzie's way with women rub off on Al? Hey, sweetheart, listen, I love you. I'll call you right back, right? Hey, sweetheart, listen, I love you. I'll call you right back, right? I got a date tonight! He's hot to trot for a big night on the town on Happy Days. Then. Hi. Capricorn, what's yours? Laverne's acrobatic boyfriend takes her to new heights on the season premiere of Laverne and Shirley. Tomorrow, starting at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on ABC. A minute ago, we saw Lori John Oganowski demonstrate her pool playing expertise. Obviously, Lori's not what you'd expect a pool player to look like. At four years old, my eyes would barely reach a table, and I used to spear the balls in with one hand. And I used to make all the balls, and everybody said, wow, she's a natural. In the beginning, it was only for fun, but then my father started teaching me the basics of pool, and I became more and more interested in it. I used to line up 15 balls on a table, and she would shoot them into the opposite side of the table with one hand, just spearing them in one at a time. And each day, she got faster and faster. At seven years old, uh, she was asked to do an exhibition, and uh, I let her go on an exhibition. We went out, and uh, she did very well. She played a couple of more tournaments. At 11 years old, Ernie Costa, who's a male professional pool player, asked me if I was going entering the world tournament that year, and I told him no. And he was kind of upset because he asked me. He said, "You're a natural at pool. You should, you know, you should be able to." win the world champion some year, and the best time to do it is now. So I entered the world tournament, and I think I came in fifth that year, which was very good for me for the first world tournament. The entire family used to just enjoy watching her and thought it was cute at the time, but little did we know it would grow into something where she would now be into a world tournament and going for the world championship. A couple months ago, I won the Eastern United States Nine Ball Championship, and I was the runner-up in the Connecticut and the New York State Championship. And then she went for the World Championship in New York City, and she got to the finals. Her opponent in the same color dress, coincidentally, would be Vicki Frecken. Let's call the nice hand from Grand Rapids, Michigan, Miss Vicki Frecken. The game would be straight pool, one rack after another. The first to put 75 balls in the pockets, winning the world championship. The rack is broken by Laurie John. Next shot's Vicky's. She makes it. Vicky's ahead, one to nothing. But she misses the second shot. So Lori John takes the table. The corner pocket. Another corner. Another corner. But she misses the fourth. Lori John's father knows she's nervous. On the second rack, they're still pretty even. Vicky gets one. But she misses the third. So time again for Laurie John. Side pocket. Corner pocket. All the way to the 
15th ball. The trick now is to pocket the 15th ball and at the same time break the rack. Either that or it's Vicky's turn. Lori John misses it. Again, Vicky is chalking up. She makes the corner pocket. But she dogs the second one, and it's Lori John's turn again. Her mother smells success. Lori John. Once again, she's got to pocket the 15th ball and break the rack. She does it. Now she's leading 73 to 55. 74. It's game point now. And 75. She's done it. Good job. <laughs> well, I really got it. I really got it. <laughs> and now here to show us even more of her skills is the incredible Lori John Oganowski. What I'm going to do is, if, if any of you play pool or are starting out to play pool, this is an exercise to help you with your concentration and your, the steadiness of your nerves. Uh, you have to have, you know, like, you have to have a lot of concentration in the game and uh, very, very, very steady nerves. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the cue ball in the air into a pyramid on these three cue sticks. Great. I'm going to raise it up, and the hardest part is taking it down. <laughs> so let's go up and down. Up and down. All right. Tough shot. Now, this would help John's pool game if he could do this also, right? <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah. comes the hard part. Are you really going to try to bring it down? Yeah. That's harder than putting it up? That's harder than putting it up. Wow. OK. John could really do this if he wanted him to, but he didn't want to show off. <laughs> John, have you got a trick shot that Kathy Lee can help out with? Oh, yeah. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Oh, good. What do I get to shoot? You don't get to shoot. You get to sort of lay across the pool table. Oh, hold oh the that's ball. good. Oh, that's you some chalk in your mouth for me. Oh, that's good. You mean good. Like, a, like a beginner? You go like this? No, I mean, like, oh, on your back. Oh, across. I'm back. shooting the ball out of your mouth. Kathy Lee, I'll help you, honey. Come on. Wait, wait, wait. I'll you tell you what. Wait, you know, lie right down. Put your head right You're here. You're so brave. Yeah. yeah. Wait, what do you mean? Shoot a ball out of my mouth. Lay across. Just trust me. Trust me, really. I would be glad to do it, Kathy Lee. Just lie down. you do it? Just lie down. It's already Tuesday night. Lie down. Out of my mouth. Just, well, it's you really easy. Help wait, just, wait, wait. I'm going to help. Lay across the pool table. Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> Put your head against the rail. All right. Down. There we are. <laughs> Keep going down. Uh -huh. Put your head back like that. That's right. Now, oh, that's is it up nice. against the rail? No. Oh, okay. Now, is it All right, right yeah. up against the rail? <laughs> yes. OK, now. I slept on a pool table this once. Is <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Very nice. This is terrible. Okay. Stay there. Stay there. Down. Totally right. Put the piece of chalk in your mouth. What? 
Put a piece of chalk in your mouth. Put it upward. You have to hold it up. Uh -huh. Hold the bowl. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't swallow the chalk. Let me help you with that, Kathy. Never eat chalk. Your mommy told you never eat the chalk, Kathy Lee. In the teeth. Yeah. Hold it real oh, tight. Real, real tight. tight in the oh, teeth. Oh, God. You got it. Okay. You got it. How's it taste, Kathy Lee? You could shut. Okay. Don't worry. The last person I, you know, did this to okay. was in the hospital and was having problems to help. Oh, hey, it's all going to hurt. It's going to fall. Are those your real teeth or you have caps? <laughs> real teeth? Uh -huh. You're going to have caps. Yeah. Here, one more thing. Could you hold these uh, across the stairs? That's it. I think that's nice. That's good. Okay. All right, there we are. Okay, ten ball in the corner pocket. Ten ball in the corner pocket. story is about a flight from Canada to the United States. Now, you may ask, what's so incredible about that? Well, what if we told you that this flight was attempted in a yellow Lincoln Continental? Ken Carter is slated to pilot the car. He's a 41-year-old professional stunt driver and car jumper who's been performing dangerous stunts for most of his life. I started messing with motorcycles and jumping cars, and then I just went after the world record. And the world record at that time was, try was set by Lucky Teeter in 1942 when he died trying to jump a Greyhound bus. And that's where it stemmed from, just jumping cars. And then somebody one day said, hey, why don't you jump two buses, three buses? And then it just a river came, and then a mile jump, and now here we are. We're in Morrisburg, Ontario, Canada, where preparations are being made for the most incredible car jump ever. For four years, we've been working on it, building it, moving 110,000 yards of dirt. I know in 1976, there were some non-believers, but there sure are some believers now. In this final moment, countdown as we get ready for a mile with a rocket car from Canada to the United States. Probably never been done before, and I don't think it'll ever get done again. At 280 mile an hour, a rocket-powered Lincoln Continental will leave Canada, climb to an altitude of 305 feet over the top of the St. Lawrence River, heading for somewhere in the United States. That somewhere is Ogden Island, New York, a mile away. Butch Butes is a race car driver who's helped build the rocket car. It has two wheels in the car, one for steering, one for flying. The car has ailerons, so you can control it in here. It's separate of the steering. All right, the gauges are for loading the car, pressuring up, and uh, making the run. He has to accurately measure out everything, more or less. It's like baking a cake, you know? You get it set, and once it's ready, you just mash the pedal and go. Ken Carter will be the first man to fly the car, and the time for that is not far away. A helicopter is ready in case there's a need for quick rescue and evacuation. There'll also be four rescue boats with divers. Everything's ready and set to go. And now this rocket-powered 1976 Lincoln Continental is pushed into its final starting position. The wings are designed to help guide and stabilize the car's flight. But first, it must accelerate to 280 miles an hour and then shoot off a 90-foot ramp. Ken must now perform a final checkout on this one-and-a-half-ton jet car, which is powered by two rocket engines and 50 gallons of hydrogen peroxide fuel. The helicopter, boats, and everything else is now just waiting for blastoff. Then, suddenly, something goes wrong. Ken has adjusted a fuel valve incorrectly, and the explosive hydrogen liquid is seeping into the car. If it should accidentally ignite, everything within 300 yards will be disintegrated. A mechanic risks the danger. crews move in slowly to wash away the explosive fuel that has seeped onto the ground. It looks now like potential disaster has been averted, but the pressure and tension of the last several minutes has left everyone emotionally drained. I knew you had a heart attack. I knew you had a heart attack. 
more to say. Okay, you can take it. Where were you? It's just too dark. I only need 10 minutes to fix it. It's just losing light too fast from the space. See where you're going. It's going to be a tomorrow morning thing. I have no choice. I'm not going to send him out right now. The attempt was postponed for 24 hours, but you can see it right after this. Button up the quality. Snap it up with style. Zip her down to see for a sale to make you smile. It's Sears All Family Coat Sale. Save 25% on selected coats, vests, jackets. In styles, colors, and sizes for the whole family. All 25% off through Saturday. Zip her down to see for a sale to make you smile. When your family counts, you can count on Sears. Are you in this yearbook? Sure. I was even a majorette. Look. <laughs> what are you doing? You smell good. What? Come on. Your breath is so fresh. That's close-up. Close-up toothpaste? Why do you think they call it close-up? It's the toothpaste with real mouthwash to freshen my breath. And it gets my teeth as white as they can be. There I am, second in line. You're first with me. <laughs> Whiter teeth, fresh breath. Why do you think they call it close-up? That's incredible. We'll return in a moment. Wednesday, the love affair that should have been a fairy tale. Can't play nursemaid to you and be in politics. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. You lost your marbles, so you better run to Pop and find out how to get them back. Jacqueline Smith is Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, a woman you'll always remember. Wednesday. Ah, drink in the pure, cold, blue sky country freshness of milk. Refresher, refresher. Save 44% oil, lube, and filter change 988 at Sears. Includes 5 quarts, 10W40 spectrum oil and filter. Stop in now at any 21st Century Health Spa during their pre-grant opening celebration of the new Northtown Mall facility with a three-year non-renewable membership for only $7.92 per month. That's right, only $7.92 per month. After a really good game, we'll be back to tell you about a really good forecast. It's a day later in our story. Let's go back and see the attempt to jump the St. Lawrence River in a Lincoln Continental. The rocket-powered car is ready to go. The driver, however, will not be Ken Carter. It will be Ken Powers, age 32. After his ordeal the day before, Carter has been judged unfit to drive. Powers is eager and experienced, and he calls a pre-jump news conference at the tip of the takeoff ramp. Okay, Ken, how do you feel about the jump itself now? How does, how does it feel right now? I feel good about it. I'm ready for it. I'm as ready as anybody in the whole world could ever be. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it right now. Carl will come up and be perked on the line. And George Calloway and other guys line it up as perfectly straight as possible. It's a fabulous piece of machinery. It can give you fame and fortune. It can kill you, too. It has to be respected. The thing about it is that uh, give a couple of words to God, hope for the respect, and give it your best, and that's all you can ask for. Everybody up on top of the ramp. Right, if I get them down, we're getting ready to perch here and go. I want to go. Though the mechanics want to double check a few details, Powers has called them off and insisted that the jump proceed. Let's go. Ready? Now it's the time. I'm going to try to buy me a drink before I go back to camp. I've never driven a rocket car before. I've never come off the line in a rocket car. Someone says, why? The first time I jumped cars. I'd never jumped either. When I try to break somebody in to train them how to be a stuntman, I put them in the car when I think they're ready. So if I can do that to someone else, who else can I say that's any more ready than me? I'm ready for it. Good, bad, or indifferent, I'm ready right now. The huge takeoff ramp has been cleared. The jump is now moments away. Five, four, three, roll all cameras, two, one. Too soon, the car heads for the river. The car is demolished, but Ken seems to be all right. He's floating. The car is floating. The body is mostly gone, but uh, the car is sitting there floating. A 35-foot parachute is still inflated. <laughs> 
one of them is. The car is being drug over to the... Uh, Ken Powers is badly shaken, but remarkably, he's okay. Here's the jump again. Watch for the parachutes. All three open, but only one fills with air. The chutes may have opened prematurely due to a malfunction, or they may have been activated accidentally by Ken or by an observer with a remote control switch. We don't know. Whatever the cause, an extraordinary stunt has ended in failure, but thankfully not in tragedy. This next story is about sudden wealth. We thought we'd ask our studio audience, what would you do with two million dollars? Well, I'd go out in the Bahamas, buy me an isolated island, a few luxury items, and ten beautiful women. And what would you do with them? I'd satisfy them. <laughs> well, what would you do if you had two million dollars? Well, first probably I'd go absolutely crazy. <laughs> And then I'd go to my shrink, who'd take a good chunk of it. <laughs> and then I think I would just go around the world. Could you tell me what you would do with two million dollars? If I had two million dollars, I'd call up my boss in the middle of the night and sing him my favorite song. Take this job and shove it! <laughs> Now let's find out what Arthur Luke did. Arthur was a school bus driver. Today, he could afford to buy the bus. In fact, he could probably buy the school. I've been driving a school bus in the city of New York for Varsity Transit for approximately 24 years. My duties were leave the house at 6.30 in the morning, go to the garage, check out my bus, start picking up children about quarter to eight, bring them into school. In the afternoon, I pick them up and do a reverse and bring them back. Do field trips in between, take them to the museum, park, Coney Island. And these are all handicapped children that uh, we, that we transport. And I really like my job. Arthur Luke also likes to play Lotto, New York's weekly paramutual lottery game. Last March at his neighborhood grocery store in the Bronx, he bought his regular Lotto ticket and filled it out. Okay. With the penny? I've been buying a New York State lottery for approximately two years since it started on and off. Since last July, I've been playing it constantly every week. Arthur purchased what's called a 10-week Lotto-matic ticket. He picked six numbers that would be entered in the Lotto computers for the next 10 weeks. If his six numbers were chosen during any one of those weeks, he would win. Arthur figured that his $10 ticket was worth a chance at sudden wealth. At 63, he earned $17,000 a year, and he was due to retire in just a few weeks. For the last 16 years, his wife had been working at night cleaning offices to supplement their income. Then came April 11, 1981. Welcome to Lotto, Kino Pick Four. I'm Bob Brown for the New York State Lottery. And tonight, the countdown has begun. Oh, I don't mean for the spaceship Columbia, you've already heard about that. I mean the countdown to see whether or not you will become the second greatest prize winner in Lotto's history. Clyde Murphy won two and a quarter million dollars playing New York Lotto. Tonight, if you are the only first prize winner with the annuity interest, you will win. Look, $1,925,769. Ready to post the winning numbers is always Lotto's lovely lady, Bonnebel. Balls are in place one through 40. Let's 
play Lotto to win the first prize. You need the six winning numbers in any order. Any order. Here we go, number 10. 10 was Arthur Luke's first number, one of several numbers he regularly bet on. Arthur had also marked number 13, as well as 32, 31, 20, and 14. Those were his picks at the grocery store that week. the six winning numbers at those six and your dreams come true supplementary number tonight is number 24 number 24 for this saturday april 11th here are the winning numbers vonabelle pretty lady 10 13 32 31 20 14 the supplementary is 24. they have drawing every saturday night where they draw the numbers i never watch because i feel if i should ever win I wouldn't want to see it. I may have a heart attack. So I usually well, I look at the numbers every Sunday morning. Well, this one particular Sunday on April uh, the 12th, I'm checking the numbers, and I know four particular numbers that I played steady. And I look at the paper, and I see these four numbers and I couldn't believe it. When I walked my wife up, I said, "Hun, I said, come on, check the numbers. I says, I think I hit the lotto. So she got up, and she looked. He said, John, you're right. He said, you do have the numbers. I said, I love you just the same. He says, yeah, I know. He says, you're after my money. I said, yeah, after 29 years. I said, I knew that you were going to become a millionaire today. And that's how it started. Arthur Luke's winning entry was the only one of 774,093 tickets that matched the winning lotto numbers. His odds of being the only winner were nearly 2 million to 1. Once the computer confirmed his entry, he was given the good news by Bill Cahill of Lotto Central. The computer printed out for us the validation number of Mr. Luke's winning ticket. It was a simple matter to go down to the microfilm library and look up that ticket and get the name and the address from the ticket. At that stage, it's an even simpler matter to uh, notify the winner of his good fortune. And in this particular case, uh, I had the good fortune myself to notify Mr. and Mrs. Luke of theirs. He says, uh, well, I would like to make an appointment with you to see you tomorrow. This was, would be Monday. I says, fine. I says, I go to work. I says, I usually come home. I have a break between 9 and uh, 1.30. I says, I'll see you tomorrow morning. I says, oh, he says, well, he says, I don't know. He says, uh, can't you take off? I said, well, I says, I can take off. I said, but uh, why should I take off? I'm home. I said, I'll take a half a day off. He said, Mr. Lucas, why were you? He said, I'd take the whole day off. <laughs> so that's why I have the idea. I still don't believe it. That's how happy I am. I never cried in my life. Becoming an overnight millionaire was a source of both joy and shock. Several days after they knew they'd won, the Lukes appeared as the guests of honor on the Lotto Show. Arthur and his lovely wife Marie have been married for 29 years, celebrated their anniversary this past week, as a matter of fact. What a week it has been! A million nine hundred twenty-five thousand dollars is incredible. They have three grown children, including a New York City detective, and nine grandchildren. And Marie, what are you going to do with the money? I'm going to buy a house, a car, and I'm going to share my wealth with my children and my grandchildren. Wonderful. I was supposed to retire anyway, the place to make my papers were in, but when this happened, I retired three weeks earlier. The day he won the money in the lottery, I heard some of the over, uh, other drivers in the garage talking, and they all said the same thing, pretty much. If it couldn't be me winning that money, thank God it was Artie. I had called up my boss, and I had told him, I says, uh, I am, as you know already, that we are the winners. I says, I won't be coming in to work anymore. So he says, Mrs. Luke, he says, if you were coming in to work today, I would have taken you to the 38th floor and I would have dropped you on your head. 
And that's how it happened. For the last 25 years, Arthur and Marie have lived here on Mulford Avenue in the Bronx. They had planned to retire here on Arthur's $13,000 a year pension, but since they'll now be getting $183,000 a year for the next 10 years, they've said goodbye to their old friends and neighbors and moved to a $52,000 home in Pennsylvania. don't miss the Bronx at all, and have easily adapted to the pleasures of suburban living. One thing I liked the best in the house was the pool in the backyard. That's number one. What I usually do is with the vacuum, it hooks up over there. And this is one of my morning chores, which I do every morning. I push things in the morning. I'm out here, I check the pool, and this is why I clean it. A new house, a pool, steaks on the barbecue, it's a good life. That now also includes a new car. I went up in a little bit of class. I bought a Cadillac compared to an old mobile I had before. And it's very good driving. It's like a good limousine. And we don't have no heavy traffic, no buses like in the city. We don't have no subway running like we are living right next to. At nighttime, it's very quiet here. We're right by the road, but the, the traffic is very light compared to the Bronx. In New York, the hustle bustle out here is not like that. You get two games for a buck and a chance to win a fortune every single week, but you've got to be in it to win it. 10, 13, 32, 31, 20, 14. The supplementary is 24. They are the six winning numbers. Have those six and your dreams come true. <laughs> turn, we'll journey to Mexico and witness the death-defying ritual that a group of Indians known as the Voladores have been performing for hundreds of years. Time. The truest test of any product is how it performs over time. Now, this. Magnavox Star System Color Television, designed for the highest reliability in Magnavox history. Design concepts, technology, advanced manufacturing systems for a picture as reliable as it is bright and clear. Magnavox, the brightest ideas in the world are here today. The search for the solution to the missing link puzzle takes us to the land of the abominable snowman. I got it. I got it. I don't got it. Can the solution to the missing link be found in the DNA laboratory? I got it. I got it. I don't got it. Or is the solution to the missing link in deepest Africa? I've got it. I've got it. I don't got it. The missing link puzzle from Ideal. The only thing really missing is the solution. <laughs> I see you're buying a long-lasting nasal spray. Why? It gives me long-lasting relief. How long? Well, it says eight to 10 hours. Here's duration nasal spray. How long does it give relief? It says up to 12 hours. That's some difference. That's two to four hours longer. That's because duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. Now, which one are you going to use? Why, this one, duration. Duration with up to two to four hours more relief. The proof's on the package. Tuesday on Three's Company. Do you know what I really want you to do? <laughs> and look out. I'm pregnant. It's the season premiere. <laughs> <laughs> Too close for comfort. Maybe going on 52, fella, but we're still dangerous. Then. They're killers. Jonathan and Jennifer try to turn the tables on murder in Acapulco. Heart to heart. Tomorrow, starting at 9, 8 Central and Mountain on ABC. Since before Columbus came to the Americas, a daring ritual has been performed in the jungles of Mexico. Tonight, we take you to that ritual, still conducted exactly the same way, with exactly the same test of courage. A lush, scenic forest in the state of Veracruz, Mexico. It's a place of quiet, awesome beauty, and the last place, perhaps, to discover a death-defying ritual. 
one of the oldest rituals in the Western Hemisphere. It's a ritual that has killed hundreds of people right here in Shangri-La. These men, Totonac Indians, are on their way to perform it. The five-toned flute and the one-note drum is their ancient signal for the ceremony. This wooden spool is their capstan, cut from a red cedar root. This is their wooden quadrant. All the preparations the Voladores do themselves. They must trust their lives to each other. <laughs> Next, one of them climbs a wooden pole 60 feet high. Now the capstan goes up. The capstan won't be nailed or screwed or even glued to the top of the pole. It's just going to be balanced there. Next, the quadrant goes up. If all this looks like a newfangled act in the center ring of a circus, remember that it was happening long, long ago, before Cortez, before Columbus, before there were any white men in America. The Voladores themselves no longer know exactly what their ritual is all about. Time has erased the answer. But some say it's a sun ceremony. Others say that for men to fly is a tribute to once sacred birds, such as eagles. is about to begin. As the Voladores climb to their eagle's nest, they know they won't be climbing down. They'll be jumping off. Every year, a couple of Voladores are killed in the course of this ancient ritual. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was banned by the Catholic missionaries. Two Voladores died only a few days before our camera crew arrived. Each of the Voladores ties a rope to his waist. It will become a lifeline. now the chief of the Voladores starts to balance himself on the capstan. From this dangerous perch 60 feet high, he plays and dances in honor of the pole that may soon take his life. must release themselves at exactly the same moment or all will lose their balance 60 feet off the ground. Gradually and gracefully, the Voladores fly down, closer and closer to the ground. Their lives now depend on the uncalling handmade rope which they have wound around the capstan. There are still other dangers. If their balance and coordination are not perfect, all will suddenly fall. again. The dangerous ritual was perfectly executed. In time, each man will face this challenge again, risking his life as his ancestors have for centuries on end. You think you'll let me through? Ask him. May I pass through this gate? Sure. For $100. 
but I haven't got a hundred dollars. Double track, a fascinating game where money talks. So do luck, foresight, and strategy. What you do on the outside track controls your ultimate fate on the inside track as you race for home. Double track has no sympathy for friendship or family. You said or age. Double track from Milton Bradley. Can an American driving machine outdistance every Datsun on the highway? If we put a gallon of gas in every Datsun and a gallon in the 1982 Dodge Omni Miser, here's what would happen. One by one, every Datsun would run out. But Omni Miser would keep driving on and on because Omni Miser has the highest highway mileage of any five passenger American car and the lowest price. And at $54.99, the 82 Dodge Omni Miser doesn't cost a dollar more this year than it cost at the end of last year. Thursday, the universe will never be the same. The best is yet to be. It's Ork's newest couple. I love you. On Mark and Mindy. Then, can anyone save Tillman from the news? We better get out. There's no rush, Sam. We can just ride by and take a look at him tomorrow. Best of the West. Thursday. Before we sign off, we'd like to thank Laurie John Oganowski for joining us tonight. And we'd like to thank the good folks at station WAFB-TV of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and KCAU-TV, Sioux City, Iowa, for their contribution to the show tonight. In the weeks ahead, here's some of what's in store. You will see the amazing rescue of a woman trapped in a plane with her dead pilot husband. The actual tapes tell the story. When someone tells Bob Corral to fly a kite, he just flies along with it. With this new chemical treatment, your house and your clothing may now repel fire. Every so often, a letter shows up in our mailbox that means something extra special to us. Here's just such a letter. It's from Gary Lee Pittman in Bloomington, Indiana. Gary writes, I'm an amputee caused by a motorcycle accident seven months ago. While in the hospital, I was feeling sorry for myself. I guess maybe that's natural. I've always been a fan of That's Incredible, but since my accident, I've noticed more and more there are features on amputees, special children, and so on. I think your show is the best therapy anyone could have. It, it's helped to let other people realize we are people too, even though something may be missing. Yeah. Gary, you make us proud. And we hope you'll be proud of the That's Incredible jacket we're sending you, along with a box of That's Incredible books to share with your friends. And here's our address as always, Post Office Box 25989, Los Angeles, California, zip code 90025, and please include your phone number. We'll see you all next time on That's Incredible. Good night. This is David Hart and tomorrow, Troy Donahue and Connie Stevens, plus coverage of the Egyptian election, Friday, Beatle George Harrison on Good Morning America. Friday, 10 of the world's most beautiful actresses square off against Hollywood's meanest and toughest men on the all-star Family Feud special, followed by Dennis Weaver and Valley Hartley in The Day the Loving Stop. Now stay tuned for NFL Monday Night Football. An ABC News Brief brought to you by Michelob Light Beer. Now, Sander Van Oker. Good evening. The United States moved quickly today to speed up shipments of military equipment and advisors to the Sudan, all part of an expanded U.S. presence in the Middle East aimed at countering threats from Libya and the Soviet Union. President Reagan made it clear that the U.S. personnel would not be sent into combat. The Egyptian government tonight has announced a new crackdown on those involved in civil disorder, including instructions to shoot on sight anyone provoking unrest. In this country, several major airlines have again reduced fares. And Continental Airline employees today agreed to a 10% pay cut to try to keep that company afloat. Now this. Hey, how'd you guys do it? Just concentrated on the fundamentals. The Michelob Light and who's buying? Michelob Light. Compare the taste. Later tonight, Nightline will focus on the growing interest in country music. More news later on this ABC station. New medical techniques save babies born too soon. Watch 2020. Meaty Bone, the first dog biscuit made with real meat. Meaty Bone is a barking good treat. Bark if you like meat. There's a biscuit in the middle wrapped with meat. Bark if you like Meaty Bone. Meaty Bone, inside there's a crunchy biscuit to help keep your dog's teeth clean and strong. Outside there's a delicious coating made with real meat.
Meaty Bone is a barking good treat. Bark if you like Meaty Bone. Meaty Bone, made with real meat.